All right. Well, thank you all so much for being here. Welcome to, we are in our, is this 10 or 11? I think we are in our 11th annual Sync Up Conference. The Sync Up Conference is produced by the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Foundation, which is, I hope you all know, the nonprofit organization that owns the Jazz Fest. And our role is to use the money from Jazz Fest for all of the free programs that we put on all year long. We're active in education, economic development, and cultural enrichment. We have a free music school that reaches some 200 students a week right here in this very building, the Jazz and Heritage Center. The front part of the building, the historic part, is our music school that has seven classrooms. Um, we do a lot of different economic development programs, including a grants program that gives out close to a million dollars a year for arts education programs. And we also put on several free festivals and uh, about one free concert a month in this room. And these are all things that we do with the proceeds from Jazz Fest. So these are your Jazz Fest dollars at work. Um, some of you may have attended our Sync Up conference in the past. Show of hands, anybody who's been to Sync Up? All right, thank you all. Now, I know you've been there. Um, the conference is something that we started a while ago to connect the music community of New Orleans with the international music industry. And we announced not long ago that we were changing stream just a little bit. And rather than putting on conference sessions in the mornings on the Friday and Saturday of both Jazz Fest weekends, which are really brutal for anybody that's been at a gig the night before, we are now doing these monthly Wednesday evening workshops, which we hope are much easier, especially for musicians to attend. And today, we've got a twofer for you. We have the interview uh, with Elliot Roberts, Neil Young's longtime manager, uh, along with Warren Zanes, who's going to be conducting the interview. He is, you know, is the guy that wrote the 2015 biography of Tom Petty. But first, we have a panel discussion on how to book a tour. And at least that's the title of the panel. We'll find out if we actually learn how to book a tour from this. But we've got several folks who are professionals in the music business, longtime professionals, each of whom comes from a very different perspective. And I'm really grateful to all of you for being here. So to int introduce our panel to my immediate left is Tavia Osby, manager of Tank and the Bangers, the now internationally famous Tank and the Bangers. Lou Hill from the band Waterseed, Paul Sanchez, Paul Sanchez, <laughs> and Musa Hamdan, who is an artist, manager, um, probably the best known artist that you manage is Currency, but also um, T.Y., is that it? T.Y. T.Y. and uh, Corner and Boy P. Corner Boy P, right. Got you. So thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it. I'm going to come to you later. Um, all right, Musa, I actually kind of want to start with you. Um, I remember you telling me a long time ago that you were booking these tours for currency that would go out to the West Coast, that would be 50 dates long, it would be him and several other artists either on your management roster or on the Jet Life label, which, which you guys run. Um, and I just was kind of blown away by that, like 50 city tours, for at the time, well, I don't, I don't remember if he was signed to Atlantic at the time, but I, I remember thinking that he might have been an independent artist, and, but independently, just yourself, without, you know, William Morris or whatever, you guys are booking these 50 city tours. Um, can you just kind of talk about how, you, you know, how did you pull that off? Well, I mean, dealing with an artist like Currency and, and the other people that's on my roster, there. They're underground artists considered, so they, they don't have the mainstream fame of, of radio and uh, currency is an artist who started uh, with, I think his popularity came with the, the basically the internet with the free mixtapes and things of that sort, so he, he built his own buzz from there. At that point, it took me to really convince uh, promoters and, and venues that this was a person that, that drew in. Because a lot of promoters that look at uh, media base or BDS or something and, and, and try and look at the, the stats to study who they should bring in. You know, so originally we started off, of course, just taking uh, very low guarantees just to prove ourselves. You know, uh, and when we did that, of course, we wanted to be on a tour bus. So in order to be on a tour bus, you got to stay on the road. You got to fill dates. You got to take those smaller cities. You you, you got to catch you know the uh, 
the, the nobody cities that they always wonder why artists don't come to. We stopped there. You know, if it was a $1,500 guarantee, it was, it was better to grab that $1,500 than to be a day off having to pay for rooms and things of that sort, pay for fuel. Buses get, get expensive, you know. So uh, ultimately, the first tour I put together with him ended up being, I think, about 65 cities. That was the first tour? The first tour. And you guys were in a tour bus on the first tour? Yeah. Man, y'all live large. Yeah, he was, you know, he, he's an artist that, that definitely likes to live large. So he was like, uh, I need a bus. Uh, well, I mean, flying is more expensive. If, if you're trying to fly six, seven people, it gets expensive. You know, so the tour bus tends to be a little, a little more comfortable. Then if, if you got a good, good set of people, I mean, you, these buses are comfortable. You got 12 bunks in there, you got showers, you, you could pretty much live on there. You know, you get a, uh, you get a hotel here and there. You'll, you'll save a few dollars, you know, but you, you have to be ready for that road life because it could drive you crazy. Yeah, we'll get into that. But um, th I guess one of the things that really kind of shocked me about that when you told me that you were doing these independent tours was from my experience, which is limited, it, it just seems that rap is primarily known as a, a dance club and a, a DJ format, and at least in this town, not so much as a live performance genre. It, I mean, every once in a while you get a rap artist that comes through the House of Blues or Tipitinas or something, but it's not like there are clubs that are you know, pretty much booking rap shows all the time and there's a consistent place to be able to go see rap and live performance if you want to. It's more records that you would hear in various places. So when you were booking these tours, were you playing at rock clubs? Were you, were you four-walling venues and just promoting the shows yourself and taking all the financial risk? How, how were you doing it? Yeah, now we, we was performing at, at you know Live Nation venues and, and things of the sort, some, some smaller clubs. We didn't do club dates. They was all pretty much venues of, of performing venues. Uh, but we, we would take, our, the risk that we take was the low guarantees. You know, and of course, getting on the road, you, one thing I tell people, don't try and promote every city. You, there's no way you could do it. The promoter in that city is best. Let them make some money. Let him promote the show, you'll get a better turnout. Uh, I couldn't go, because then I, I would be required to be in every city a month in advance, six weeks in advance, to try and help promote the show. You know, then you'll be definitely spreading yourself too thin. So, uh, you know, now the other thing is, rap does actually get out on the road a lot. The, the rappers tour all year long, mm -hmm. you know. They're, they're constantly out, and there's promoters out here that just book hip hop bands, mm -hmm. you know. Um, a lot of mainstream hip hop I see do more of club dates and what we consider one-off dates in comparison to underground artists. Underground artists tend to stay on the road and do more touring, but touring is definitely where it's at. Touring is where, where you're able to, to, to pick up less money in a sense of per date, but more money in the long run, as well as build yourself to becoming more of a festival type artist in comparison to artists that do one-off dates that I see in hip-hop at least, they don't tend to do too many festivals. And the, the career is, I think, has a, has a shorter span because they're not out as much. And the fans that, that tend to like them are, I think you're only as good as your last hit in that sense. Uh, where in comparison to a, uh, a underground artist who tours basically behind his music, they develop a more hardcore fan base. And with Currency and, and most of the artists that I do manage now, that's the, their fan base is pretty much more hardcore and they're, they're, you know, they're more, uh, it, it helps out in the end, merch sales and things of that sort. Thank you. All right, let, I wanna get some of the other guys in here. Uh, Lou, I wanna, I wanna go to you next. Um, similarly, to, to Musa's, or at least my interaction with Musa, you also have a band, which is a great band, by the way. Has anybody seen this band, Waterseed? You guys need to check them out. They are really hot. Oh, here's a plug. They're gonna be at our own Congo Square Rhythms Festival this Saturday. That's right, that's right. That's right. Yeah, you guys, yeah, they're like earth, wind, and fire. Like, it's really fantastic. Um, but you guys have also booked independent tours of like 50 cities at a go. That's right. So um, 
this past summer, probably when we went on our most extensive tour. So like two and a half, three months from coast to coast to promote our um, latest CD. Uh, same thing, uh, a lot of the same situations. Um, you have to play the big towns, the small towns, make sure your routing is proper, everything in low guarantees. I can, I can be honest, we, had, we toured with nine people. We weren't able to do a bus. And I'm only one of my uh, band members is here, so I don't have to worry about it. See, we need a bus. So honestly, nine people in a 15-passenger van, like traveling the country, gear, everything, uh, sneaking into hotel rooms to make it work, everything. It was, it was a very extensive tour. But tour for us makes everything else work because you don't have the tools that you had maybe previously. You don't have radio, even college radio is sometimes. So our best calling card for us to get our music spread around outside of the internet is to go from city to city. And just from touring, we were able to push um, the CD that we released like to number 27 on the R&B Billboard charts. And that's off of sales at shows and that kind of thing and really building our popularity. It's, it's a grind. You have to have the right group of guys because if you don't, it will collapse. Um, and, you know, <laughs> I mean, I just have to have a lot of faith in what you're doing and pride in what you're doing. And what I would say to people, if you're part-timing, it probably won't work. You know, if you're in it for the dollar right now, it won't work. You know, you have to really commit. So anybody that joins our fold, I tell them, look, um, if, you're, if you want to play with us to, like, pay your cell phone bill, it's not the band for you. If you're trying to, like, pay for your grandkids, then, then you need to take the ride. And that's, that's, so we set that tone with everybody, our main guys and our side guys, because it's, it's a process. And yeah. So um, congratulations on the success with the record. Um, but still, I mean, I think, you know, just from the, the relatively few show of hands of folks that have seen your band or are familiar with the band, I have to imagine that booking those shows when you're, you know, not top of the charts, not top of mind for most people, that's got to be a real challenge. I mean, were you guys well, first time in a market? Are you getting $1,500 guarantees? In some markets, yeah. The trick thing about Water Seed is that I think Tank and the Bangers was the only group that knew that we were doing stuff before we moved back home. Our popularity is much bigger outside of the city. So when we came back to New Orleans, we'd already sold out Apollo. We'd already done certain things. Uh, and to be honest, and I'm born and raised here, so I don't want anybody to get crazy about it. We learned about the music industry after we were displaced in Atlanta and where we were actually in the industry and had to compete with industry people. So, and, and what I mean by that, um, one of our shows that we did was opening, Janelle Monet opened for us. So that was the competition in Atlanta. So. It, we had to completely understand and build relationships, and that's what we did. We built relationships um, that stretch beyond just the city. So I could call somebody in Philadelphia, I could call somebody in Pittsburgh, I could call somebody in LA. They knew us not because our New Orleans relationship, they knew us because of relationships we built outside of the city, and that helped us a lot. So um, we could get a few thousand dollars in certain cities, but they were anchor dates, and then you would get $500, and then you would get whatever, and you just have to build it out, and it's very tricky, it's very stressful, it takes weeks to like put a tour, oh, well this pays this, I wanna play main cities on a weekend, I can't, oh, it's a door, it's, it's crazy, it's really the most stressful thing that we do is booking tours, and just now it's starting to get easier, but it's the most stressful thing we do, and, um, I, I would give advice and say that um, you have to build relationships, as many relationships as possible, and people will take a chance on you and hopefully give you an opportunity. And when they give you the opportunity with a guarantee, you have to destroy the show. There have to ha if no one comes to the show, the promoter has to think, I messed up because you guys are amazing. That's the way it has to be, so you have to present something that's so phenomenal that they're like, I gotta get you back and I'm gonna double the money. And we've had situations like that, so. Awesome. I'm gonna come back to you. 
Um, all right, Paul. So a lot of people may be familiar with your career and your history, and so people would know that that you have um, lots of experience touring with a rock band that did pretty well, and you guys toured all over the place. But now you're um, a solo artist, and so you, you tour on your own. And so one would assume, and I don't know if this is necessarily true. You, you on? Yeah, I'm on. Okay. That um, by, by virtue of being a solo act, that it would be a lot easier to get bookings because theoretically, at least, you can work for less money than a nine-person band. Is that, has that proved to be the case for you? Well, I don't know that it's any easier to get bookings. It's easier to get less money. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's pretty much all the same stuff that these guys have been talking about is you just have to work. You know, you have to work the computer in the morning, you gotta work your tunes in the afternoon, and you gotta work your social media in the evening. I saw something actually on Facebook, it said five reasons nobody goes to see your band. The first reason was you suck. But, <laughs> but the second reason was you don't go to see anybody else's music. And the third was you're not plugged into your friends and family's lives like birthdays and weddings and things. You gotta, you gotta be part of the community to have people part of your community, and that's, it applies around the world. I mean, this, this touring thing ha takes me to Europe as well. And you're part of, the, that's your community, is the people you meet out there on the road. You should be kind to them. They're gonna help you get gigs, they're gonna help you get fans, they're gonna help get your music out there. Um, I was in Cowboy Mouth, we worked 270 days a year. So all I knew in rock and roll was just work. Make records and go play the music because that's how you get paid is going to play the music. You sure don't make money off the records. So when I left, actually before I left in 2000, the lead singer of the Plimsolls, a guy named Peter Case, went solo. And Griff, John Thomas Griffith was reading in USA Today that he had made a solo record and instead of doing a small venue tour, he was gonna do this thing called house concerts. And Griff said, dude, we, we, we should do that. We're in cities all over the place with Cowboy Mouth. So Griff started doing it, and it was unbelievable. We had as many as we could want. We had to turn them down. And I used to ask him, how do you get them? And he would just say, due diligence, man. And Spencer Bowen's a big hero. Spencer's been playing since, I mean, he's only a few years older than me, but since I was a kid, he's been doing the road life. And I asked him once, and he said, when he wakes up in the morning, he gets his coffee, he gets online, and before he allows himself the pleasure of his guitar, he finds a gig. He makes sure he's got work before he gets into the music. And I adopted that philosophy. I wake up, I get my coffee, I get online, I send out emails, I look for work before I ever practice. So I happen to be old, that helps. People know me from Cowboy Mouth, they know me from having played myself on Treme, and people know me from the Nine Lives musical that I've worked on. So if I essentially post on Facebook, I have a gig in Cleveland, Ohio, I'm looking for gigs around it. Fans, people love to help. They come out of the woodwork and say, call this venue, do a house concert for me, call this festival. People love to help you, and all you gotta do is push the ball, man. Don't, you know, don't not make the phone call. It's gonna be tons of rejection, don't get me wrong. I send out 15 emails that morning, I'm gonna hear back from one or two, maybe. But I'm gonna send them out, you know, I gotta work. And they, it seems to just keep happening. In the same way that they're talking, you, you create momentum with your art and with your buzz, and you maintain it by creating more art and more buzz. Now my tour bus is a Ford Transit Connect with a sleeping mat in the back, so it's not quite the same life, but you know, it's the same principles. Thanks. To, now our, our first tour bus, I'm gonna be honest with you, is 12 bunk bus, we had 18 people on there. So you know, you know your first tour, you bring everybody. Come on, you know, we got room, <laughs> sitting room. <laughs> so we're, we're on 60-day tour with 17, 18 people. Uh, bus drivers complaining, telling us, too many people on the bus. We just tell them, look, give them a little hush money. Don't report us back to the touring company. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, you know, it, 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 it get, it's fun, though. But it, it's definitely, you know, like, like he was saying, like, you, you got to have a good group of people. Uh, because, you know, we've slowly cut that down to eight people on the bus. That's still a lot. You know, yeah. We toured with uh, eight and ten, and that's, 
Yeah, those lines eight, just get eight. crowded fast. Yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely, especially when the, with the uh, the after parties. Yeah, the, the guests, you know. I don't know how y'all do it. I honestly don't. All right, Tavia. So, people who have been paying attention to you and your band over the past couple of years um, probably know a little bit about the story. Tank and the Bangers, um, very unique original band from here in New Orleans. Um, you, you've done sync up panels in the past and talked about how the band came together and how you uh, decided to have a, what I like to think of as a team building exercise where you decided to go to England and camp out for a few months just as a way to build your buzz and do a Jimi Hendrix routine and get popular in England before you came back to the States and then just continually kept building your buzz until Last year, you guys signed with High Road Touring, which is a significant uh, booking agency. I don't know if they're considered a major or if they're just a big independent, but uh, based in Sausalito, California, and but they represent a lot of really big acts like Robert Plant and so on. And so that was a great opportunity for you guys. And then, of course, anybody that has watched your tour schedule knows that basically ever since last May, you all have pretty much been on the road the entire time like with barely a day off and almost no vacation um, since that time. So you guys have been thrown into the whirlwind big time. And so, I mean, I'm actually curious about a few different things, but first would be, I mean, what were some of the steps that you took to build that buzz before you got to the point of being signed by a, a big independent booking agency? I mean, how did you build that buzz? Hello. Um, <clears throat> well, um, when I got with Tank, she was in more of in the poetry world, and she released a, a poetry album. And after that, we were with a group called the Black Star Bangers. Um, and we got with another singer in the city, Elia Love, and at the time, Nate Swire. And we were like, okay, let's put all of our connections together so we can get out on the road. Tank hadn't done many gigs in the city at this time. This was like 2011, 2012. So we went out to poetry venues and did shows. And we built a buzz like in Philly and New York at the time. And we kept doing that, like not taking money. Like we would do gigs at home, and because poetry venues, they're just really trying to book a poet, and they they'd be like, hey, we we want to book Tank for a feature, and then I go, hey, um, we have this collective going on. How about you guys book Tank? We get a low guarantee and bring all of those people out there. But the way we did it was we were all sacrificing income from shows at home where we had a bigger um, budget so we could fund ourselves out there. So we did that for a couple of years before we started getting phone calls saying, hey, we want you guys to come out here. I mean, we've had times where we've done music venues with just two people in there. But like Lou said, you gotta do it big every time. Well, were y'all working day jobs or something? I mean, how did you survive in, in those lean years? We have, we all have a very great uh, support system, I would say. Um, when I met Tank, she was still staying at home with her mom. A lot of the fellas were doing church gigs, which were consistent for them, so that's how they were taking care of their families. Um, and yeah, just support from family and friends is what helped push us. And then, um, speaking of the, the London trip, uh, we came up with the idea of throwing these big backyard parties and selling food and drinks and just being in our community and also having a stage for other artists to come on and perform. So that money really helped us a lot, and we continued that un up until we won Tiny Desk. Now, it seems like 
with the exception of Musa, <laughs> perhaps <laughs> I could be wrong about this. Like it, it's because Musa, it, it sounds like from what you're saying, it sounds to me like you guys were just making money from the get-go as soon as you started touring. I mean, getting fairly high guarantees and doing the bus well, and doing the big. Well, band. we didn't. We didn't have, mind you, I supported the music because I had a car shop. I have a car shop in New Orleans East that we, we build, restore cars. So I was taking outside income to support what I wanted to do. Ah, well, see, that's all you got to do is you just have to own but, another company but and, when we, and make all sorts of money on the side but and, when and we support did your music do the habit. tours, when we did do the tours, we was able, I think, to generate enough money from touring. We didn't come home with a lot of money, but we definitely got out there comfortably and we was able to spread the music and, and I think I always do the same thing with, with, any, with any company, especially with, with currency. Um, a lot of problems I used to have was currencies considered a marijuana wrapper. Really? So he's, he's an advocate of, uh, of medicated marijuana. So of course we got booked by high times. So that was a good thing. They brought us to Amsterdam a couple of times. Uh, he was a judge on the seven, uh, the seven room where, where they judged the top strains. So people, people definitely loved him for that. I'm sure he remembers it vividly. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. So um, it was hard. You, you, you couldn't get corporate sponsors like talking about it because people was just so against the movement at the time. You know, I remember one time we, um, a guy plugged me with uh, some people from Kevin Hart. Kevin Hart had something in New Orleans, and I think it was Coors that was doing it. And Kevin Hart was like, "Yeah, I like Currency. I like his music. Let's, you know, let's get him on as one of the judges." But legal canceled that. It was going to be a good check too, but we missed it because of that, you know. But uh, when when he started creating his music and, and everybody, there was actually a cult of people that wanted to hear that style of music. So it was just like I said, convincing the promoters that he's actually an artist that can draw a crowd and can sell hard tickets. So one, once we was able to do that, then we was able to get the guarantees. But you know, we I've done that with a with a shoe company, with a Reebok. We released a Jet Life Reebok shoe. Same thing, they wasn't sure should we do it. You know, they gave us a, a very small guarantee, but we took it just to prove the point. Uh, they released 6,000 pairs of shoes on them last year during All Star. All 6,000 sold in less than 10 minutes online. So now they came back to release another shoe, but of course now we Did could talk Did the shoes have joints in them? Uh, no, but the, the, they, they had the appearance of a joint. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, they, they was a very attractive shoe, especially to the, uh, the, the lovers of uh, the herbal essence. All right. Well, my question is, I mean, do you all agree that at least in the initial stages of your touring career that you have to invest financially? into the career in order to get to the point where the work is coming? Basically, I mean, you, were, you said it, sacrifice money. Did, so did it, did it cost you financially to go out and play gigs out of town as opposed to just being able to go out and start, you know, getting decent guarantees and, and just, you know, coming home with fat pockets every time? How, how much did you have to invest? A, a dollar amount? Or, you know, or in lifestyle, I mean, you know, <laughs> comfort. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, we, we sacrificed comfort. I mean, I'm, I can speak for myself. I definitely sacrificed um, comfort. I was coming from nine to five jobs, pretty good jobs. Um, so, I mean, it's expensive getting out on the road. It's expensive renting cars expensive to eat every day out on the road, pay for rooms. I mean, in the beginning, we were like staying with people we knew, like cutting any type of corner we could cut to save money. It, it's very, very expensive. I, I can't put like a certain dollar a month amount on it because it depends on like where you at in your career. 
but in the beginning stages, I would say the word sacrifice will be huge. And it's cool if you're making money on a other uh, side of things. And I think a lot of musicians, um, you know, can tap into other ways of making money. So I know some people play with multiple bands. I know some people write for people or, you know, there's there's many ways you can tap into it. Um, I'm managing a hip hop artist right now and he does these influencer things on uh, social media. Sometimes he, get, he gets paid like $2,200 to just post because he has a lot of followers. So um, there's other ways to tap into bringing in income so you can go out on the road. I'll bet you Lou knows exactly how much money he invested in the touring career before you guys started making money. I, I'm trying to forget. So, <laughs> uh, so I was a, a music educator for many years. And um, <laughs> I mean, I've invested tons of money in us getting on the road. And I actually did not quit my day job until the pressures of being on the road started conflicting with going to work every day. Um, so yeah, you have to invest. And look, if you're in music, I, I tell this to as many young artists as I know, being in the music industry is like running for office, especially nowadays. And we were having this conversation earlier, um, and this maybe is another subject, but it, it ties into this, is you have to invest, 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 because everything is about uh, your popularity. So it all goes into your buzz, that word has been said. If you have a big buzz, you can ask for more money. You can get more support, but you have to invest. So not only in the road, in everything across the board, very few people just wake up, make great music, and it's, it gets them there. That just doesn't happen anymore. So um, yeah, I've invested tens of thousands of dollars and I can honestly say the moment I quit, the first year I quit my day job was the first year that actually my day job was hindering my ability to really get everything running the way it was because I've always had the cushion. Oh, we don't make so much, blah, 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 blah. Now it's like, no, this is what you're gonna pay me or I'm not gonna be there. So um, we kind of shift gears and said, okay, well, we don't have a cushion, so we have to make this work somehow. The animal has to feed itself, and we have to find ways to do it. We've slept on, we, I think we've slept in some of the same houses in Pittsburgh, yeah, yeah. depending on what's happening, because we noticed some of the same promoters. So it's, yeah. hey, yeah, you know, so you, you do it because you're trying to get to your fans. Fans don't care if you didn't sleep last night, if you drove 18 hours to get, they don't care. They want a great show, and you have to give it. So you have to invest, you have to get to the stage. So. Uh, anybody interested in touring, I don't know of a way to do it without losing first. You're gonna lose and really, it, it weeds people out basically. If you're not cut out for this, if you can't do one meal a day on the road, if you don't, haven't figured out that IHOPs and Denny's even though it's unhealthy, you know, blah, 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 you know, try to stay away from fast food, but you find ways to make it work in everything you live for the stage when you get there, and that's your refuel, you know, for doing it, but money, if you're planning on touring, save, that's all I'm gonna say, save, 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 and yeah. So giving up the cushion of the extra income from the day job forced you to make the touring operation more efficient. Exactly, and made me become more creative, so uh, this tour that we're setting up for this summer, well, it's gonna be for a while, but uh, we're, we're now getting endorsements. We're getting people to finance portions because we have so many dates. We have, we're in so many cities. We have so many videos. Social media is important. If you have so many views on your videos, it's nothing for you to put something in your, on your social, hey, I'm at Red Roof, hey, and they'll give you money to do that, and that supplements everything that you're doing, and you really need that, so, yeah. All right, the next Water Seed Tour brought to you by Motorola. There you go, we'll, we'll take it. So Paul, investing, investing in your I mean, you career? Invest, you invest, in, you're, you're all in or you're not. You invest years, you invest money, you invest intimacy, you invest lack of intimacy. You are in or you're not. 
in the early days of Cowboy Mouth, we traveled around in a four-passenger Nissan van with the equipment hitting us in the back of the head every time Fred saw a cop because he would always lock up the brakes. We shared one hotel room and you, we rotated. You got to sleep in a bed or, or the floor and, or I would sleep on the dresser. Like I would clear off a dresser and just put a blanket on there and sleep on a dresser. And later on we got a tour bus and it was great. But even now, it's a 24 hour day, seven day a week hustle to keep your music alive. If the email pops, you answer it. If the phone rings, you get it. If your friends that work nine to five don't understand it, you say, bro, that's the way it is. That, that's, I, gotta go, I gotta take this call, this is money. You know, so it's Louis Armstrong to the day he died, somebody would call him a great artist and he would say, baby, I'm just keeping my hustle alive. And that's what it is. You just try to keep your hustle alive in every single way you can. And every day from the time you wake up till the time you lay down, you're dancing as fast as you can. So there were, uh, this is a question now I wanna ask all, all of you to, to chime in on. Um, there are, for people who pay attention to this kind of thing, some, like, some rules of thumb that we've all been told are the, the beginning steps that you take if you're trying to launch a touring career. If, you're, if you're, you're a baby band from whatever town and you're trying to get started, that number one, you have to start playing in, in your hometown and just start organically there, build your own buzz in your hometown before you even venture anywhere else. That um, when you've done that and you've got a sufficient buzz in your hometown, then the next step is to pick a town not too far away that you can drive to within three or four hours and try to line up two or three gigs um, on, on a weekend and see if you can do that. And if you can make that work, then pick another town 50 miles further away and keep building that concentric circle larger and larger until you've got yourself a, a, a touring radius of 500 or 1,000 miles or something like that. And then if you happen to get a high paying gig in a far away town that you have to fly to, then take that money from the anchor gig, make it an anchor, and take a bunch of low paying gigs around that so that you use the, the high paying gig to subsidize a, a mini tour that you might do around the, the anchor dates. So, I mean, those are the things that everybody who goes to music business class is told this is what you have to do if you want to start. How many of you have heard similar types of, okay? Well, that's kind of old school now. You know, that's, that's how we did it in Cowboy Mouth because th that was pre-internet. You know, now you can make friends in other towns and say, I play this size room in New Orleans. What size room do you play in Austin or in London or whatever? I trade gigs with people all over the world. You know, people love to come to New Orleans for a gig. So I got... I can say, yeah, I'll, uh, especially for songwriters, yeah, I can bring you and we'll do a gig together and that's got me to, to the UK, it's got me to Holland, it's got me around the United States. And did you have to do the same thing when you started your solo career? It's just, I'm, I'm, that's what I'm doing now. I mean, we did it in Cowboy Mouth, that's, and, it just, and that just grows, like you do it, we did it in the frat circuit, right? So we were playing frat houses like you do. You, that's how you get into the venue in that town. And then you meet another band that's doing that circuit in the SEC, like Hootie and the Blowfish was at the time. So we'd go and open up for them at some dump bar in South Carolina, and they'd come open up for us at Tipitina's. And then next thing you know, Hootie signed, and you're still friends. So they're taking you on arena tours. And then all your friends that we toured with, Matchbox 20 and Sister Hazel and uh, uh, Adam uh, Levine's band and Maroon 5, all these bands that we had done clubs with, now we're doing arenas together because each of us were getting signed and each of us were reaching different levels of success. But you stay friends with everybody. And the first person you want to help is your friends. Now an artist gets to that level of success that Hootie reached and there was only so much they could do for us because we didn't sell that kind of record. So when they say we love our friends, we want to take them on tour like they had been doing for 10 years, then they got managers saying, well, I got this artist on my roster. You got a record label saying, I got this new artist with a record coming out, I'd like you to take them out. You got the booking agency saying, hey man, I got you guys here. I need you to take out a band. I need a break in this region. You don't really get to help your friends out as much when you get to that level, but it pretty much works that way throughout your career. There's always the opportunity. Darius Rucker still brings me out on the road for a few dates. You know, I performed with him at the Grand Ole Opry just because he's the kind of guy that'll bring an old friend on stage in Nashville and nobody knows who the hell I am. So it's a friend's business, just like most businesses are. If you're a doctor, it's a friend's business. If you're a you know, if you're a news reporter, it's a friend's business. If you're a banker, because you want to, like, it's just, it works the same way in music as it does in whatever business you're in. 
if somebody's a pain in the butt and they're really talented, and the guy next to him is not quite as talented, but he's a really great guy to work with, that's the guy you're going with. The first time you might work with a pain in the butt because you got stars in your eyes, but the first time that pain in the butt puts you through the ringer, man, that guy right there, he's got one less chop, but he's all right, I'll take him. Be nice, be professional, you'll get work. Thank you. So, um, so what I was referring to about the concentric circles and you know they're building your radius from but now your it's home internet compound. circles, you know. Right. So you're talking about internet circles, but I am curious whether any of the, the other panelists have had that type of experience. Did you actually do that type of thing, or did you figure out a way to jump in without having to go through all of that work? Um, for us. No, we, we didn't make a strategic plan, honestly. Like, we did more shows away from home than at home. Our first shows were in New York, in Philadelphia, in uh, North Carolina, South Carolina. And then we did a little club in Mobile, and this little club loved us. And our first show there, they paid us $500. And it was crazy, like they loved it. And so then the promoter who was booking for that show, he kept calling. And then I was able to say, hey, can we, you know, can we up it here or up it there? We went there for at least a year straight, at least once a month. They were really into it. And, and then we started doing stuff that was closer to home. And then we started doing stuff at home. So we kind of did things a little, Backwards. You went to Philadelphia once a month. No, no, the the spot in Mobile. Oh, okay. That, no, okay. Oh, okay. we couldn't do that once a month. <laughs> now Paul would do that. <laughs> yeah, no. Because you go from Oakland to Miami to, to Los Angeles on your I, tours. I've chased money wherever somebody's offering it. <laughs> Lou, how about you? I, I would have to agree. For us, um, like what's hard for us with touring now is we still like the Southeast is not our region. You know, uh, it's really not. We do well in Florida, uh, Mississippi, Alabama, really nothing for us. Our first time playing Houston was about two months ago. Great show, but we'll do Austin again. But our regions are West Coast, Midwest, and Northeast is where we do really well. And to be honest, we, we moved back from Atlanta about four years ago. And it was crazy is our first gig we moved back was the Essence Fest. So... We did that gig and then we like played, I won't call the name of the club, but we did a club on Frenchman that's, anyway. So the, the idea was that we were a touring band and we had no desire to, I shouldn't say desire, but we really weren't marketing New Orleans at all uh, because our sound is not really a New Orleans sound. So about two years ago, we made a conscious decision to say, well, we're here, let's just market here. And I'm, I'm, I really love all the new love we've been getting. Um, it's been great, but people are like, you guys are coming out of nowhere, and it's amazing. It's like, wow, we've been doing this a long time. We've just been kind of hiding somewhere, you know? And so we really just came into the market like without that learning curve, per se, uh, depending on how, how much history you know about the band. But we, we jump, it, it's, it's literally like we jump from place to place to go to markets that are gonna receive us, you know? So um, we don't think about building that circle. Uh, and as Paul said, the internet, basically the world is your market. You know, um, the, our first gig in the Pittsburgh area was a DJ that heard an album. He hit me up on Facebook and said, hey man, I got some investors, I like your music, blah, 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 blah. Okay, we'll come out. They had the right pl price. Like every show we've done in Pittsburgh is sold out. The same thing happened, uh, we were in Atlanta. We released a live album. Uh, a guy in Germany was like, I love your music, I love your music. I want you to go to Russia, month one. Two months later, I love your music, I want you to go to Russia, month two. And I'm just like, whatever. Then six months later, he's like, I want you to go to Russia. And here's the deposit, here's the visas. Can you do three months? All right. Here's a deposit visa. Okay, oh, cool. We went to Russia for three months. I don't know anybody in Russia, but that guy heard, grabbed our music from somewhere and put his money where his mouth was. So we went to Russia and did a residency in Russia for three months. So it's, it's that, that bubble. I'm almost like you're hurting yourself if you do that bubble because 
the internet has re, is rewrites the whole book. And it's great to have home support. It's great because it is your jumping point. And we, we're still doing the same thing. We play um, certain shows that are purely financial based for us to tour. It's, it's our show, but ideally in our marketing scheme for who we wanna be, it has nothing to do with that. It's just our show, we're perfecting our show, but where we wanna go, we need the revenue to move forward. And that's what you have to do. You have to consistently be very disciplined with your money and, and the guys with you have to understand this pile goes to the business. This pile is going to you and they have to understand that. Now you have to show results or else they come in, you know, beat you up, but you got to show results. So, yeah. How many of y'all have investors that are willing to invest in a three month tour for your band? Thought so. Okay. <laughs> Musa, concentric circles or just jump to the West Coast in a tour bus? Nah, well, um, I think, I'm not sure with every other genre, I think, but mainly in hip hop in, in New Orleans, you don't necessarily get your start here. Um, New Orleans hip hop scene, as far as what is supported by the masses, is more of the uh, bounce form, you know. So if you're a hip hop artist as far as a rapper and not a bounce artist, you, you tend not to get the support from the man. Like, you know, I mean, even with, even with the festivals, when you see the, who they book, they book the older rappers that were on a major platform at one time, and they book the bounce artists. Because the people in the masses like it locally and some have ex exceeded outside of the local area. So with us, with, with, with all of my artists, we've, we've always had more success uh, elsewhere. The Midwest, to be honest with you, most of, as far as I know with hip hop, Midwest loves New Orleans music. They, they, and, and I studied that because prior to Currency, you gotta understand, from the beginning, I started a record label back in 1990. At that point, I had an artist who later on signed to No Limit Records by the name of Fiend, and I had another artist by the name of Devious D. I studied Fiend's sales when he went to No Limit, because once he went to No Limit and left No Limit, I became his manager and not his CEO. He came to me and asked me to manage him. Uh, so at that point, I studied his, his sales and I saw that the Midwest, Chicago, was a huge market for him. D.C. was a huge market for him. So we used to go do shows with the go-go bands in D.C. Uh, so, you know, because musically, of course, you know, we're, we're jazz is in us. You know, currency as well. His form of hip-hop is more jazzy. The beats that he chose to rap on are more jazzy. He's performed with a lot of jazz bands, you know, uh, Soul Rebels, we've done a couple of shows with them, you know, so uh, he made, uh, we make a bigger impact, I think, outside. Even if you look at, at someone like uh, the big labels that came out of here, No Limit. Master P really made his first move in Richmond, California. He became popular in Richmond. His song, Bout It, Bout It, which was the one, I think, that tipped him over the edge. Once he did that, he wanted to come back to New Orleans and shoot the video here. And that's where he really grasped the, the local, uh, local scene and the people really supported. And I think that's what pushed the majors at that time to come sign Cash Money Records because they was looking for the next big hit. What's the next big thing out of New Orleans? At the time, Cash Money had the biggest buzz. So they, they get the, the crazy $30 million deal from Universal because it was a competition thing, you know. But when, when we was doing it, we was going, like I said, we'd go to Chicago, D.C., uh, currency shows like New York, SOBs, you know, 200, 300 cap rooms. You know, we, we was doing that type of stuff. And now we get to support more, you know, from New Orleans. But originally, no, it, it definitely did not start locally, you know. Um, unfortunately, everybody wants home to love them, but Sometimes you got to go get your love somewhere else, and then we tend to open our eyes and see it down here. 
I know some of you guys must have some questions, so if you do have a question that you'd like to ask, please just come and use the microphone over here. So one of, uh, if you do have any questions, please just go ahead and, uh, all right, go, <laughs> fine, don't. <laughs> I've got plenty. Um, so if, I mean, all right, so I think we all understand that the internet has changed a lot with everything, record sales, but, and also the ability to tour, but let's say, you know, you're a relatively young band, you put out your first record, you get a digital distributor, and you're on Spotify, and you're on, every, you know, everything, and all of a sudden you start noticing that you're getting uh, three, four hundred likes from people in the Pittsburgh area. And you say, okay, great, I should go do a show in Pittsburgh. Well, that's still a long way away. I mean, you got to get there, there's hotels, there's meals, there's, um, I mean, it, or airfare if you can afford it. I mean, that's still a very expensive proposition for your first time out. Is that where the, you know, the, the, the money from other sources comes in? Yeah, well, I think you have to, um, the Pittsburgh example, number one, if you're getting three, 400 likes, there should be a tastemaker in that area that's hip to you. And that person can advise you about the promoter to go to, the person you should speak to. If not, you could talk to one of those 300 people that have liked it and reach out and say, hey, would you like a show? Who do we talk to? It is quite far away. It's about 15 hours away, 16, I know, because I've done the drive many times. So, but you, with that many likes, there should be some trail to connect you into something. What's the radio station? What's the college? Where are these people getting my music? And we're in the age of information, so you should be able to look at all your metadata and figure out where these people are getting the information. Um, and that's why you also, hopefully if you released your album and you're playing locally, you do have some local support. So at that point in time, you tell your guys, hey look, we need to do these shows, we need to save money, we need to ask family members, we need to do whatever we can to like do it. If you have a day job and it's just a one-off in Pittsburgh, hey, look, you know, a, a very good friend of ours, a famous uh, soul singer in the Richmond area, his name is um, John Bibbs. John says, hey man, I'm gonna eat ramen for the next, you know, month to just like afford to do the things I wanna do. So it's like that type of sacrifice. So if you wanna get to Pittsburgh, you need to get to Pittsburgh. You just need to do it. And if it's your first time, if you want to succeed at anything or in this business, there's no like magical wand that's gonna come and you're gonna feel really comfortable all of a sudden. All of a sudden, it's going to be very scary, very uncomfortable. You just have to do it, and as you do it more and more, it comes together. But I would advise they need to reach the family or Uber, you know, and raise the money. You know, yeah. that's what it's about. Raise the money and go. And, and um, I want to add to something that I tried um, in the beginning too was if there was a city that was far out and we got a good offer and we didn't have anything going around, uh, Google is a very good friend. Find cities leading up there and look for what bands are playing in those cities. Like sometimes, like, Paul was saying, sometimes you can reach out uh, to other musicians and, and say, hey, you know, I'm going to be in the area. Are you guys doing a show? Or look at other musicians' schedules and reach out and say, do you have an opener? A lot of people have opened for us by doing that. So um, the internet is your friend mm -hmm. here now. Use it. Use Google. Use the tools that they have on the internet for you when it comes to touring independently. Plus, honestly, that, that gig in Pittsburgh, if you got 300 likes in Pittsburgh, or for me, it's like these guys, Chicago, the Midwest is where it works for me. They love New Orleans up there. So if I got that one gig in Chicago where I got my 300, 400 likes, then I know that's my anchor gig. I know I'm gonna make money. I go to Chicago all the time and make money. There's about a half dozen places in the Midwest where I know I'm gonna make money. So I take that first gig, take the Pittsburgh gig, but I, when I take that gig, I know I'm talking about a two week tour at least. It might even go further because if the money leads me away from home and not back to home, I'm gonna keep following it. And when I reach the end of that trail, I'll find on Google the way home. 
I'll find cities that know New Orleans music that have heard of me, and I will get myself home from the money gigs in Pittsburgh and DC and the places I do make money. I take the smaller towns, but sometimes, uh, like you were saying, you're gonna have to take maybe not a, not a great town on a weekend because you're working your way there or you're working your way back, but you're working, yep. you know? And, and I wanna add to the, the band, the working band in the area, Look, there are a lot of venues, you can be the headliner, have whatever, they won't book you unless you have a local opener. It's certain things like that, but the, there's certain bands when we go into certain markets, like think of Detroit, we won't play unless we have this opener. It's because we like this band, it's a good match, we do what they do, we do, and they become your street team. They become the people that promote, they become the people that, hey look, they're coming back. So those relationships with bands that you make around the country, it's, it's crucially important because they wave the banner for you. Uh, and then really, when they try to come or come to New Orleans, you return the favor. Hey, come to my show, and so you're consistently swapping as much as possible. And everybody wants to play New Orleans, you know, so yeah. that's the thing. Yeah. But if you get that gig in Pittsburgh, let's say it's a you know, $1,500 gig, and for your band, that's a big fat payday, and so you're gonna make that your anchor. Okay, great, so I'm gonna drive up there, I'm gonna drive back, and I'm gonna have gigs on the way. The Pittsburgh gig is on a Saturday, so you need, you know, Huntsville on a Tuesday, and Louisville on a Wednesday, and I don't know, Des Moines on Thursday, so that you can get there. But you know, then you, the, if you are ever able to get the club owner to return an email or on the phone, they may say, oh, I'm booked on Tuesday, sorry. All right, well, what about Wednesday? Or you know, it's routing the dates so that they line up and just getting the, the club owners or the talent buyers to return your calls can, can be maddening it's in its hustle. own right. Yeah, man, it's a hustle. But you, I mean, that's the gig, right? Yeah. You, you can't, like, okay, you got turned down on this route. Well, the map goes like this. What's the next nearest place I can try and make money and keep this thing rolling? Because it doesn't stop. You know, like you were asking how much you've invested. Well, it, you're, you're in or you're out, and that means, like, maybe this month I had a great month. I, I covered me and the band. Maybe next month, Paul Sanchez music takes a hit because I hired the band for a couple of gigs and took a chance on something and I gotta pay the band. So it's not like you stop investing at any point. Not a lot of my friends that are my age, 58 years old, could live the life I live. They, they, they're horrified at the notion of driving around city to city and meeting strangers every day and the food and the whole lifestyle. But for me, I can't imagine going to the same job every day so, I mean, this is, I'm suited to it. It's, it's what I was meant to do. It's not for everybody. And, and I think also you have to know your numbers. If you know your numbers, sometimes it may be uh, better to drive right back. Uh, ideally, you want a tour. Uh, but if your guys are going to be on the road and to do the hit and come right back, it's horrible. It's, it's, the drive is ridiculous. It's like to Pittsburgh. It's horrible. But if you can do that, pay for just two ho nights at a hotel. Uh, guys, we're only gonna eat gas station food or whatever. You know, you do, you have to know your numbers and have an idea of, project what your numbers are gonna be so that you can say, okay, do we, and you have to talk to the people you're working with. Are we gonna extend this? Or are we just gonna do this and come back? The best thing to do is extend it. Because if you're out there, you wanna touch as many people as possible. But you gotta kinda know who you are, what your band is, what type of artist you are, where you are in your career, because you may not get any calls that just may be that one off. But you gotta kinda be realistic about where you are in your journey. But when you say your numbers, do you mean you need to know your cost per day? You need to at least project them. You need, so to, you, you you need to know how much it costs your band to be on the road for one day. Right. Like how much is it gonna cost to rent the vehicle, how much are you gonna pay for and gas, how, ma how much for meals, how much for hotel, mm -hmm. per diems, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. Take home. And, and just now touring so many years, uh, now I can like do it off the top of my head. But it took a while for me to like really figure out, okay, I know how much the gas is gonna be from here, whatever, you know. And flights don't work, you know. It's, you're, yeah. not, you're not gonna fly, because even if you fly to Pittsburgh, well, you need transportation from the airport to the gig, and then if you have instruments, it's, it doesn't, it's hard. It's, you know, it, it's really tricky. So. 
um, you got to know your guys. You got to know what's happening in the best way that you want. Plus, you know, you're teasing about my willingness to drive from Miami to San Diego for a gig. But if I drive to California, say I take shows in San Diego, L.A., and San Francisco, I'd book those shows three to four months out. The closer it gets, the more excited people get. Oh, you know, Paul Sanchez is coming. Maybe we could get a house concert in Petaluma. Maybe we could do something in Modesto. If I have booked myself on a flight, it's the cost is prohibitive. To change your flight, to book extra flights, to get rental cars. If I have my vehicle and somebody at a week out, two weeks out says, can you stop? Yes, I can stop there. But I've seen your tour schedule and you have gigs on a Monday on the West Coast and on Tuesday on the East Coast. You gotta fly sometime. Um, well, I, that, I know the gig you're talking about. I had three days to get from LA to Charlotte. That was rare, that was for a friend's wedding and I promised them I'd be there. So I did make a cross country drive in three days. But normally I would, I would do, be more sensible about it. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll talk. Question. Hi, one, two. Um, I wanted to ask just about, uh, you guys were referring to the road life and how you kind of keep your head together when you're on the road. Um, so, you know, everyone kind of looks at um, Excel sheets, uh, maybe Google Docs, maybe a project management system, maybe there's some kind of uh, notebook you guys are using. I'm just kind of curious about um, whether there's any uh, kind of uh, documents or like kind of some of the things that help you stay grounded as all this kind of like everything around you is changing. I try not to change the routine that I have at home. I wake up and I exercise and I meditate. And if I'm on the road and I feel like oh, I got to get out, there, you know, I got to leave, I got to make time. I tell myself that you, ha you know, you have to do this. You have a half hour to give yourself to exercise. You have 15, 20 minutes to meditate. That's how I stay grounded, is to make sure that I have some routine in my day. And it's sort of on you, you gotta self-govern. If you drink, make sure you don't drink too much. If you like smoking weed, make sure you don't smoke too much. Everything in moderation, because you got a road to make, you know? You got, I mean, that's the most important thing, especially for me, is like, I'm driving myself, so if I don't, keep my head together and my body together, I don't make the next gig and I don't make the money. And it's all about making the money, as my friend Shamar Allen says, make the money, make the money. And so for us, I'm the uh, manager, tour manager, and on the stage, so it's a little different. Uh, so <laughs> the, first, the first thing is you have to have the right people with you, because there were times when Everybody, I think, kind of knows me as kind of like a mild mannered guy, but there's some guys that I played with that's like he's crazy, you know. So that it, you have to have the right guys. You have to stay hydrated. I know this sounds very basic, but when you're in the car for the sun is beaming, you have to stay hydrated. I recommend do not do any type of fast food. If you do it, it's gonna destroy you at some point in time. I mean, it's gonna, your energy is gonna be zapped, you're gonna be tired, you're gonna be sluggish. Don't do any fast food. Try to eat as healthy as possible, if that means going to a grocery store or whatever. Uh, as far as documentation and everything, uh, I have a person in the group that also helps me with the business aspect. So uh, I just started using Google docs, and I know that's real bad. So what I do is I put everything before I hit the road, I have all the reservations, everything in a folder, and I can get that from my phone. So everywhere I go, it's like, um, again, it's nine of us. So I have a policy in the car, don't ask me any questions. You know, when we get there, we get there kind of deal. Don't ask me where we stand, don't ask me da -da -da -da. find it on your own, you know, kind of deal. So, because those little things get to you, and they wear you down. What time is the show? My friend wants to come to the show. It's like, look. My job is to get you to the show, and that's what I'm doing. Tell them to go to the website. So you have to like set limitations and know your own personality, know what works really smoothly for you. Uh, Google has been amazing because I don't really think about it. I put the, I look, I put, we're talking about Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh, and Google Maps, and I just get there when I get closer. I put in a hotel address, blah, 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 whatever, you know, so that part is easy. Um, as far as, uh, getting to the venues, because no one spoke about that, someone has to go in. Oh, you said you would have a drum kit. I don't have a drum kit. The band is like all kind of craziness. You have to like really 
center yourself, and there'll be times where you have to put your foot down and say, this is what it is. But for the most part, as I've gotten older, I've had to learn that if I let myself really get riled up, it's unhealthy, you know? So it's like, you want to try to stay, at least for myself, I have to stay like really just real cool and even kill if something's not right, I, I address it in a different kind of manner. I don't get mad, per se, at least it doesn't look that way. I just get very direct, very professional. So you have to really um, know what type of person you are when managing it. Make sure all your stuff is in one place. Um, you can, it's hard for musicians, if you can get a credit card, you need that stuff's gonna happen. You know, uh, be prepared. Um, Wow, I, I can't say anything else outside of just do it. <laughs> All right, we're, we're gonna have to wrap this up in just a minute. So before we do, I have a couple of other quick questions that I wanna ask each of you, just like real, real quick. Okay. Um, do you have a, all right, well, before I ask that one, all right, door deals, yes or no? Will you take a door deal? Yes. 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 No. Okay. <laughs> Is, well, three of you have already answered the next question. Is there a minimum fee below which you will not perform? Yes. 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 How can you say that and a door deal at the same time? Well. I don't it, take a door deal unless I know, like, I, I take a door deal where I know I'm going to do well. Because yeah. I, was about I take to a door deal when I know I'm going to do well. You can actually make more money than door deal. If it's, if it's yeah. a thing I'm going to think I'm going to lose money to go to a city, no, I'm not going to take a door deal. But if I want to play a certain venue in Chicago, well, I know I'm going to do well, and they say, hey, it's a door deal because that's what we do. I just say, yeah, I know what I'm going to make. I'm not worried. Yeah, same mm -hmm. here. Like, so you'll take it if you know you have experience in that venue or exactly. that market. Okay. Yeah. I won't take it in a new venue, no. Right, okay. Now, I, I think, you know, if there's a guarantee, then, I mean, if there's a low guarantee, then it's kind of a door deal, you know, because that you're getting paid by how many people are coming through the door. But a flat door deal, no upfront money at all, no. Because I'm, I'm depending on the promoter now right. to sell the tickets. And, and if, I think sometimes if a promoter doesn't have something invested, then he's not going to promote as much. I, it's just a feeling I have with promoters. You know, the easy deals, they just don't, you know, if they lose, they, what are they losing? They booked the venue, they might have had a friend that owned the venue. You know, they didn't do any advertising, they didn't do any flyers, they didn't do any social media. So you, you end up losing. So I like to say, you know, you want me there, at least show me that you're willing to lose something. And if you're willing to lose, and I'm also willing to take a lower guarantee to get there, because I'm losing, I'm, the guarantee's only really getting me there. I'm not making any money off the guarantee until you get to that point that you can ask for the, the most money. And, and what, we, what we do a lot is we do versus deal. So it's like, I need this, I need this security versus 80% of the door. And, that's, and whichever that's does do. better. Right. Yeah. Yeah, we do the same thing. Um, we had uh, here at the Sync Up Conference several years ago, we had the head of High Road Touring who uh, was asked the cl classic question about um, festival gigs. Everybody always assumes that it, the, the best opportunity is to play a festival because you don't have to worry about how many people show up and the guarantee is always gonna be higher than you would get in a club. He said, to the contrary, it's, it's not worth playing festivals because if you're on the seventh stage opposite Robert Plant, then he's gonna be playing to 10,000 people and you're gonna be playing to 10 people and yeah, maybe you got a, a, a big guarantee, maybe you got $2,500 for that show, but you didn't do yourself any favors because you're not building up any audience. Much better to go out and play a hard ticket show at a club for those few people, if it, that's the case, who want to see you and, ha and build your audience for the people who really want to see you rather than being a soft ticket act on you know, the 13th rung on a, on a festival. What do you think? I think it depends on where you are. Uh... If you're trying to build your buzz and you're playing the New Orleans Jazz Fest and five people are there, it's on your resume you played New Orleans Jazz Fest. And that's what's important if you're starting. Now, if you are um, someone who um, you're moving up the rung, it is, if you're gonna do a festival, you know, depending on the festival, I think you need to be in choice, you know, positions. Like you need to be 
in a prime position if you really want to, you know, take advantage of the situation, I think, me personally. So I think it just depends on where you are in your career and the type of festival. Is there 10 stages? Are there only two? Is there one? What's the turnout kind of thing? I kind of agree. Um, Tank and the Bangers' first festival was New Orleans Jazz Fest, and only the workers saw them along with maybe you two or three for the other ducks. people. Right. Yeah, and, but they, they went out and they did a great show for those few people there. But at the time, we were building the resume. Because when you go out of town, people want to know, what have you done? If I do take this chance on you, what have you done? And a festival looks good to people. They don't know how many people saw you when you played. Plus, I grabbed the festival gig because that's your anchor gig. There's your money. So now I got money. I really don't care. It's not on me how many people show up to that festival gig because it is a soft ticket. It's the festival. It's on the promoter. I'm getting paid. My band's getting paid. So that's a good gig for me, even if I played to the five workers while Robert Plant played to 10,000. Hell, man, I did Jazz Fest, and I played the Langyap stage while Bruce Springsteen was playing on the big stage. Now, some of my best friends said, I got to go <laughs> see Springsteen, you know? I'm sure you wanted to, too. But, you know, my answer was I played Springsteen songs, Thunder Road, in my set to the few hundred people that were in front of me and said, the 10,000 or 100,000 people watching Bruce can't even see him sing this, but y'all can see me fine, you know? <laughs> and those people will never forget that. And so you take the money, you take the gig, and you, you're, not supposed to, you're not supposed to be doing it for the size of the audience. Right. You want to have a great audience. You want to build, and you want the course, you know. That, but that, if you're doing it because of the audience, then you're fucked if you don't mind my saying so, because if you're not doing it because of you, because you're compelled, because you have to, you have no choice. If I had any other choice, for God's sakes, I would have done something that made money, that you know, made the people in my life proud of me instead of shunning me at some point in my life. But, but you could, you didn't. You, were on, you, you did this thing, you chose this path, and you gave up life as a music educator. You gave up money, you gave up whatever you had to give up to be sitting here because and so the gig's a great gig. You know why? Because I get more. I'll get the really cool venue gig where five people show up and tell me how awesome my songs are. And I'll have that festival money in my pocket to sit there and buy them a drink. That's right. Musa, festivals versus hard ticket. Uh, I mean, I like festivals. I like festivals only because I think it, it helps the artist grow. It, it, uh, even if it's five people, it's five people that, that probably wouldn't have seen you. You know, so they may spread the word to the next five or the next ten, and, and it does look good on your resume. Uh, and one of those five people might be that Russian, the guy who got right. in Russia. Definitely. You know? It may, it may be that person at book shows elsewhere, you know, who happened to be there early. Uh, so I think it does, it, it, it helps the artist grow. Uh, I personally have an artist that hates festivals. He hates to do them because he says that's not my audience. He doesn't want to perform for people that don't know his music. But at the end of the day, it builds and you get a, you know, you get a bigger fan base from people actually, you know, you hate to say forcing them to hear it, but giving them a chance to hear it, which is a chance that they wouldn't have taken necessarily if they wasn't at the festival to see the bigger artist. You know, so I, I agree with us. I like them. Uh, I like to do as many as we can. And they definitely do pay more. All right, last question, then we got to go. Um, biggest mistake in booking a show that you've ever made? I know there's so many to choose oh. from. <laughs> Lou, I know you got a, a million. Uh, I don't. <laughs> this is funny. I'll say this. Um, we haven't had a horrible road experience. We haven't had a horrible experience. Even the shows that it's 10, 5 people, um, some of those shows are where we've built relationships to get bigger gigs. I'll say that every situation we've been in on the road, I've learned a lot from it. So uh, there are no major flaws that I can think of that we've gone through. Even There's the been gig with no drums? Uh, well, we resolved it. That was a learning lesson for me as well. Like, you know, get these drums or blah, 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 you know, kind of deal. But uh, so. No, it was, it was all a learning experience and it just prepares you. You know, it's like going into the wild, wild west. You don't know what you're gonna get. So I would say, um, oh, there's one, see, yeah. 
we did, last tour was one of the last Midwest tour dates in, um, it's a big venue in St. Louis, huge like the size of the singer, the promoter, booked this contract, uh, everything. We get there, <sighs> beautiful place, horrible sound system, literally in the middle of the show, I had to stop the show and we finished the set acoustically. Uh, and it was the worst experience I've had. Um, and then on top of that, uh, the promoter still hasn't paid me all the money. So, um, and that's after sending her like legal documents and stuff. So is that happens. That was the first time it's ever happened. If I have anything to do, it's gonna be the last time. So that, there you go, you got one. So. All right. Mm -hmm. Biggest mistake in, in a long life of big mistakes booking shows was in the late 90s, there was a songwriter in Texas named Pat Green. Pat was really big in Texas and he was friends with Fred and he said, well, Cowboy Mouth needs to come and do this show across the border in Mexico, across from Acuna, Texas. So if you've never heard of Acuna, because no one has, and no one has heard of the town on the other side of the border, but he swore it was gonna be this really fun show. So we take the gig, and two days before the gig, Pat calls Fred and says, I canceled the gig because there's a drug war going on down there in that Mexican town, and there's a biker fest that weekend, and they're expecting violence. Well, he could afford to cancel the gig, but we're two days out, we gotta play the gig. So we call the promoter and we find out we have to drive our van into Mexico. So we're gonna drive a rock van into Mexico, which of course they, they searched us. And we get there and it is every Mexican and Texas biker that wants to go to Acuna. Not the really fashionable bikers that want to go to Juarez. You know, we're talking about some really tough looking characters. Our bass player at the time was a woman, Sonia Tetlow, she's beautiful. I spent the day following her around because she was getting shadowed by the shadiest looking bikers. And I knew she was gonna get dragged down an alley and to steady my nerves, I drank sangria all day. <laughs> so we finished the show and the promoter paid our tour manager, who was a woman, on the floor in front of all these bikers. He pays us a few thousand dollars and he shorts her a thousand dollars. And she was a pretty tough chick. She counted it right there on the spot and she goes, another thousand. So now it's like every biker in the place knows we're packing 10 grand and we just want to leave Mexico. And I, we get into two vans to leave and I'm in with Sonia and our tour manager and Griff and I'm drunk as a coot. And I, I remember leaving the club and being grateful and passing out. And the next morning at breakfast, I'm hungover and Sonia says, that was awesome the way you bribed that cop in Spanish last night. And I, <laughs> and I said, what? And she said, yeah, we got pulled over. And it came back to me. They had gotten pulled over, and I was passed out. And I woke up, and there was a cop with a flashlight in their face talking Spanish. And they didn't understand what he was saying. And I leaned over and said to him in Spanish, I play guitar at El Club Corona. How much do you want to let us go? And he wanted $60. I turned to them in English, and I said, he wants $60. And I passed out again. But apparently, I can bribe a cop in Spanish when I'm really drunk. That doesn't sound like a mistake. All right, can you guys top that story? <laughs> I, no, I can't top that story. <laughs> biggest mistake, real quick. Um, I think my biggest mistake um, was going out on a first tour with little money and booking a, a huge RV for like six of us. That, the, you know, financial mistakes has been, I'm just getting to a point where I'm, I'm knowing what to do and what not to do. I got you. Musa, sounds like you've done everything perfectly, so you, clearly you don't have any mistakes. We, we had a couple of mistakes. I think our biggest mistake was trying to get across the Canadian border on a tour bus smelling like, uh, oh. you know. Not anymore, it's legal there now. <laughs> it was, but it was legal in Canada. Oh, okay. And we was coming back to the US. Oh, that one. Oh, but, the other way, okay. <laughs> but we literally was 16 hours of shut down, searched, took our money, took everything on the bus, you know said that we didn't claim the money. Mm. So being that we didn't claim, but we didn't have a chance to claim it, you pulled us over. Uh, we had to fight to get the, the money back. Mm. And it was the US border that took us in, not the Canadian border. Wow. So it, it, was, yeah, it was a mistake. Next time, fly into Canada. Don't, yeah, no Canada buses. Rough. And Canada fly back, yeah. I guess. Fly back. All right, well, um, thank you all so much. And please, a big round of applause for our four panelists. Kavia Osby, 
Lou Hill from Waterseed, Paul Sanchez from Paul Sanchez, and Musa, the great Musa. All right, uh, don't go anywhere. We're going to start the interview, our headline interview uh, for tonight in just a couple of minutes. Thank you all so much.